tell me the story of Jesus. That's been a, one of the greatest delights of my life to get to stand and tell that story of Jesus. Uh, it never gets old. I never get tired of it. I can't tell it enough. It means so much more to me than I can ever tell you. Everybody wants that you know. Everybody that you know wants to hear the story of Jesus. Everybody. You say, now wait a minute, preacher. Not everybody wants to hear the story of Jesus. Now listen to me. They all want to hear the story of Jesus. Yeah. They may not want to hear about your church, or they may not want to hear about your job, or your family, or uh, your religion, but they all want to know about Jesus. Because yeah. you're never going to find anything wrong about Him. He does you nothing but good every day of your life. And uh, the gospel is good news, it's not bad news. And everybody wants to hear that. <clears throat> Today, we're going to hear the story told to an official of the Ethiopian government. Today, in the book of Acts, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 8, verse 26, uh, we've been studying through the book of Acts this uh, summer here at the Cowboy Church. And uh, today we're going to listen to the story told to an Ethiopian. This man was on his way home from, uh, from one of the festivals in Jerusalem. I, I suspect he had been to Pentecost. He was there and, and because of all the trouble that happened because of Stephen's stoning and we don't know all the details, but in, nevertheless, this fellow is on his way home. Yeah. Heading back down into Ethiopia and uh, he has while he was there he by the way he was a rich man this uh, Ethiopian he was a pretty well off fellow the reason we know he was pretty well off is because he had bought him a scroll of the of the God of Isaiah he had he brought him a bought him a scroll there in uh, Jerusalem and on his way home uh, as he's riding along in his cart he was reading the scroll of Isaiah you say now preacher why why would that be so expensive because folks they didn't have printing presses back in those days. And every book or copy of her scroll was handwritten. And it probably took a scribe uh, maybe a, a month to copy the, the Isaiah scroll. And so it was a very uh, valuable piece of document that he had in his hand. And uh, just like the rest of us, when we travel, uh, unless, unless you're driving a truck where you're not supposed to be looking at and reading at the same time. But, so he was riding along in his uh, wagon and he was reading the scroll of Isaiah. And uh, that's where we're going to find him today. Uh, now today also we're going to meet one of these first deacons that came along in the early church. Uh, these guys uh, were appointed by the Holy Spirit via the apostles in the church uh, to serve the church. So they elected several of them. The very first one that we've heard about was Stephen. Of course, Stephen was martyred. He was killed for his faith in, in Jesus. And then uh, we'll, we'll, the one we're going to hear about today uh, is, is, of course, he was another one of them. And his name is Philip. And so Philip uh, was there. Philip went up into Samaria and was up there uh, telling the people about Jesus. And uh, so while he was up in Samaria, up in the northern part, of uh, north of Jerusalem, an angel uh, of the Lord came to Philip and sent him on an unannounced to an, to an unannounced destination. Uh, isn't it funny how in the Bible that a lot of the times when God sends His people on mission, on projects, He doesn't necessarily tell you where you're going to wind up, does He? He just tells you to go. And it kind of gives you a direction. And he, so, so this this angel said to Philip, uh, I want you to go uh, down to uh, the wilderness road. Uh, not just any road. Uh, this desert road or this wilderness road. It goes down from Jerusalem uh, in, in the foothills up around uh, where Jerusalem was, down toward the Mediterranean, down toward Gaza. Now, you've been hearing a lot about Gaza in the news lately. All right? That's, so he was going from Samaria, which is up north of Jerusalem, and he was going to go down to Gaza, or at least the road that led from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's where he was going. Join with me in verse 26. <clears throat> Let's read this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south. To the road, the desert road. Now that, that word road desert is better translated wilderness road. It's not necessarily a desert, but, but the better the better translation would be wilderness. That goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, we don't know about this story, how it worked. We you know the Bible tells us to be careful that uh, lest we entertain strangers unaware. We we don't know. Uh, 
was Philip aware that this was an angel until he got away from him? I think sometimes we don't realize we've been around angels until we, we get out of their presence. And and uh, so we don't. Was it a dream? Did did this angel come to him in a dream? Was it a face-to-face -face meeting? Uh, we don't know any of the details. Just the Bible, the Acts. Just Doctor Luke tells us in Acts here that the angel said, that "Just she showed up and told him what to do." And here's the thing I want you to get. Oh, Philip, he obeyed. Yeah, he obeyed. Now that's a pretty good idea, don't you think? When God or one of His angels tells you to do something, just do it. Don't ask a lot of questions. Just, just do it. Just get up, get up off the couch, get up, and get to going, doing what God called you to do. Now, I, when I was thinking about this today, I remembered old man Abraham down in Ur, down in the Chaldean, down between the Mesopotamia, between the rivers. And God came to an old man Abraham down there one day. He said, Abraham, I want you to go to a place I'm going to show you. Just get up and go. And Abraham, of course, then got up and followed the Lord. Uh, now, here's the thing. If I'd have been Philip and I'd have been up there in Samaria where, where this Simon guy was we talked about last week and where there was having a lot of people get saved up there in Samaria. A lot of good stuff was happening. I might have said, well, now, Lord... Are you sure you want me to go down to that desert road, that wilderness road? Because, man, we're having a good time up here in Samaria. I mean, people are getting saved, and, and the power of the gospel is, is beating down these demons. And, but uh, we don't know what happened, but uh, he went. Let's, verse 27 there, it says, So he started out. I like that. So he started out. Angel said, Go south. So he started out. Now, his destination was not a place on the map, but his destination was a person. I think that's interesting. Uh, whom the Holy Spirit had decided was important to the spreading of the gospel. Did you know that, that God's pretty smart about that kind of stuff? <laughs> Here was this man and and uh, he, this, this deacon as up in this town of Samaria. And God said, I want you to go south and I want you to go to the to a certain person. Now, now uh, I don't know that He told him to go to that person, but He wound up meeting. Let's just read it there. Keep reading with me. And on his way, see, on his way, he didn't know where he's going, but on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of, of Kandake, uh, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now, I'm told that in Ethiopia there is a group of people that modern genetics have discovered our, Jew, our Jewish ancestry down there in Ethiopia. Some have theorized that these people may very well be one of the lost tribes of Israel that made it down into Africa. And so recently genetics have proven that there are several of these people who have, Jew who have Jewish uh, DNA in them. And so uh, this man was, was maybe uh, of a Jewish dis uh, 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 origin and he'd come up to Jerusalem because every Jew, you know, wants to come to Jerusalem for a worship service to, for one of the Passovers, one of the holidays. But nevertheless, he came up there to worship. Now, he was uh, he was an interesting fellow. I don't know if you're aware of this, but tradition tradition tells us that Solomon uh, had a, 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 a romantic encounter with the Queen of Sheba. Have you heard about that? Yeah. And so this this lady, this Queen of Sheba, apparently uh, tradition says that they had a son that was born out of their relationship and that the boy went, went back with Queen of Sheba back down into Africa, uh, down to Ethiopia, down there, and uh, that's where he, he stayed with his mother. Now this is another extra biblical traditional thought was that some people think that the boy came back to Jerusalem years later and stole the Ark of the Covenant and took it back down with him to Ethiopia. By the way, they still think they have it down there in, in a building down in Ethiopia. The Ethiopians think that. So, Interesting background stuff here going on. So whomever they were, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> whoever this guy was, <clears throat> he was on. He was an important person, and he was gone back home to Ethiopia, <clears throat> back down there to work for the Queen of Sheba, this lady named Kandake, which which is the title of queen. Uh, <clears throat> that was her title. So verse twenty eight says that on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Now, while, as I said there, while he was in Jerusalem, uh, <clears throat> this treasurer 
By the way, he was the, the treasurer of Ethiopia. <clears throat> so he had bought him this copy of Isaiah, this scroll, and, and uh, as I said earlier, only a person of wealth could probably have afforded it. <clears throat> and so he, he tra was on his way back home. They tell us that he was traveling in, in a four-wheeled wagon. Uh, it's called a chariot in the King James, but the original language <clears throat> in the background there, give me just a second, I'm going to have to drink something. <clears throat> that frog in my throat's got his legs crossed. <clears throat> yeah, I got him. I got him wet. I'm wet him down. <clears throat> okay, so here we are. He was in this four-wheel wagon. They tell us, and they, he wasn't by himself. You know, he had a an entourage with him. He had people that were with him because he was a he was a big deal. I mean, he had uh, slaves and servants and. And so whatever, he was on his way back down there riding in his chariot. Uh, uh, he, he didn't want to wait until he got home to read his scroll. He just started reading. And so they tell me that in the ancient world, <clears throat> that when you would, so people would, would read the Bible, they wouldn't read it silently like we do. You know, we sit around, wife and I sit around the house, she'll read a book and I'll read a book. We're both sitting there in silence. Everybody. But they say that in the ancient time, when they read, they read out loud. So this man, who was very well educated, he was reading the book of Isaiah from Hebrew. He was reading out of the Hebrew language. And he was reading out of that and, and uh, as, he, as he rode along the road. Verse 29. <clears throat> the, the Spirit told Philip. Now, wait just a minute. Who talked to Philip the first time? An angel. And now the Spirit speaks to him. I guess what I'm trying to say is he was being led by God. The Lord was speaking to him. He was listening to the Lord. He was following the Lord's leadership. The Lord sent an angel. And that, then we don't know the Holy Spirit probably spoke to him. I don't think we need to cut this too fine right here. I don't think it's a big point. But I just want you to know he was listening to the Lord. So the Holy Spirit, the Spirit told Philip, go up to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So Philip, so he, so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. <clears throat> so Philip asked the question that opened this eunuch up to conversation. He uh, uh, he was, you know, that opening, how, how did he get into that conversation? It's kind of interesting. He just said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And, and I'm sure that the guy said, well, man, how can I understand this? I mean, somebody, I need to know what we're talking about here. So, uh, we, to us today, we immediately, if we read the book of Isaiah, and you and I read it, when we read it, we always say, well, that's talking about Jesus. We understand that it's talking about him. And we'll read some of the things. It says he was, he was lamb, you know, like a lamb led to his slaughtering. He didn't open his mouth. And, you know, and he talks about the red. We believe he's talking about the crucifixion. It's easy for us to see. But see, when Isaiah wrote this, it was by prophecy. He was looking into the future. You see, Isaiah, don't even, I don't even think Isaiah knew for sure what he was writing about. He just wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about this man who was going to be, who was going to go to his slaughter. He was going to be led like a lamb there. And so Philip, of course, knew exactly what that meant, just like you and I today know what that meant. So he immediately, he, he said to him, that, that, that you're reading about Jesus. And then he, he started telling him about Jesus. And so, uh, so that's how that got started. So verse 32, this is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. Now, let's, you and I, when we read this, I'm going to start reading it here just a minute in the second part of verse 32. Let, let's and see if you and I, we don't have any trouble figuring this out. He said, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Now you and I know today, we understand that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We talk about the lamb of God. We, we, we get that. And so when he began to explain it to him, you see Isaiah told him, he said, here's the things you need to get. He didn't open his mouth. He was, so, he, so as he's reading this, he couldn't figure it out. Now, I want you to notice here 
the, this portion of Isaiah, let's compare it. First of all, he was silent. This, was, this lamb was silent. He didn't protest. He didn't, uh, he didn't cry out. He didn't resist his crucifiers. Are you aware of that? Jesus could have got out of crucifixion anytime he wanted to. He could have just said, no. He was God, by the way. And, and when, if he said no, I mean, everywhere in the universe, they'd understood, no, we're not going to do this. But he was quiet. He was silent. He didn't try to defend himself. He didn't say, no, wait a minute. You know, you're killing the, the King of glory. You're killing the Lamb of God. He didn't, he didn't defend himself. He didn't cry out. He didn't ask for rescue. In fact, Pilate asked him one time, said, Pilate said, uh, are you the king? Are you a king? And Jesus said, yes, I'm a, I'm a king, but not of this place. I'm a king, okay, but I'm not, I'm not a king here. You understand what I'm saying? Well, he, he knew where he was king, but he wanted Pilate to know he wasn't going to be a threat to him. But he didn't cry out. He said, uh, and then I love it when, when Pilate asked him, are you the Messiah? And, and Jesus said, yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. He didn't deny it. He knew. And, and he told him, yes, he was. So his silence is the first thing that the Isaiah talked about. Then the next thing was Isaiah talked about justice. Verse 33. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Now, friends, you and I know that Jesus Christ is truly the only innocent person who's ever lived on planet Earth. Amen. You know that, don't you? All the rest of us are sinners. We were, we're sinners. We're, we're, we're uh, lost as an entire human race. We're lost. And, sinners. and so Jesus didn't have to die for His sins. He was sinless. He came into this world without without a father. In other words, he didn't inherit that old Adam's fallen sin. He didn't come into this world with the DNA of Adam in him. He came into this world with the DNA, DNA of heaven in him. He was sinless from the beginning. So he was he didn't deserve to die on the cross. He died for the sins of others. He died for your sin. And he died for my sin. He died for us. Not his own. So he was deprived of justice so that you and I might be given grace. Jesus took my sin, He took my failure, my shame, and He took it all upon Himself. And He paid for it with His own blood. Yes. Amen. He was deprived of justice so that I could have grace. And then He died. I want you to get that. He died. I mean, He died. Uh, let's see what Isaiah said. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. He didn't have any descendants. He, he, who could talk about his children? He didn't have children. He died. He couldn't, he couldn't bear children because his life was taken from the earth. Now, said, we know Jesus died. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, you, know, you all know this story. He, he was hanging there on the cross and he said, he, he looked up to heaven, he said, he said several things, but he finally said, into thy hands... I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head and he died. He died. He didn't just pass out. He didn't just faint. He died. But he died because he chose to die. He died not because they killed him on the cross. He died because he chose to release his spirit and to pay for his, my sin with his death. Now, how do we know he was dead? Let me, let me tell you how we know. When the Roman soldiers, and by the way, there's, if there's any group of men on planet Earth that ever knew what a dead man was like, it was them. They knew dead men when they saw them. Now normally when they find a, somebody on the cross, and this was, this was getting close to evening, they didn't, and the Jews didn't want him on the cross overnight because of Passover and things. So they went around and they broke the legs of all the uh, people that were being crucified till they came to Jesus. And they did not break His legs. Why is that? Because He's already dead. They knew death. He had already died. They do. So <clears throat> and then they took His body down off the cross. There were several of the women there and, and, uh, and, and Nicodemus and others. And they took Jesus down off the cross and they wrapped him in this shroud 
uh, you know, we, we think today the Shroud of Turin was uh, was what he was wrapped in. And whether that is or not, I, you know, that my Christianity is not based, my faith is not based on that shroud, okay? Yeah. But it does give me great excitement to think about Jesus may have leaving his impression on that. But they wrapped him in that body. They tell me that he was wrapped like on his face and his, and his mouth and all over his whole body in 70 pounds of spices. That's, what the, that's about the normal amount of spices they would put on a person. Wrapped in that, just imagine being in 70 pounds of leaves falling off your trees and then wrapped in a sheet real tight. If he hadn't have died on the cross, he'd have died in the, in the ground. You with me? I mean, he was, he was suffocated there. <clears throat> In, in the grave. <clears throat> so, uh, he, he died. He did. His body was guarded by a squad of Roman soldiers. Now, again, these folks knew how to keep things safe. I mean, they, they had a squad of soldiers right around that grave. They was afraid somebody might come and steal his body because Jesus was quite an interesting figure and, and there was a lot of tradition, a lot of hype about him, a lot of excitement in the air about him, and they were f afraid, uh, you know, the, the rulers, they just didn't want Jesus' body to be taken out so there'd be any question about it. They wanted to make sure he was dead. So they sent a death squad of Roman soldiers and said, guard that tomb with your life. If, if something happens and he's and he gets out there and somebody steals him, you're going to die. I mean, that's the, that was the kind of common understanding. So they had motivation to watch that grave. They wasn't nothing going to steal the body of Jesus until Easter Sunday morning. Until Easter Sunday morning. And they, the ladies, of course, went to the grave early and the tombstone was rolled away and the tomb was empty and and you all know the rest of the story. Jesus came out of that grave alive. And Jesus, uh, now Dan Brown in his movie, The Da Vinci Code, he tries to make the case that Jesus was married and that he had children, and you know, all this heretical stuff. And somebody's always got to try to figure out something, you know what, to, to confuse it. Let me tell you something. Jesus died and he wasn't married and he died for our sins. And, and his blood is, is what covered my sin. Now the children... Jesus had children, by the way. I believe He did. I'm one of them. <laughs> and you're one of them. I'm one of Jesus' spiritual kids. Yeah. If He had a refrigerator in heaven, He'd have my picture on it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, because I'm one of His kids. He's, he'd be proud of me. He's proud of me because I'm a child of the King. <clears throat> by personal choice, you and I, we chose to be adopted into His family. Yes. He grafted us in to that old, into His root. He cut us off the Adam, the old Adam line. The old, he cut down the old Adam tree. And He grafted us into the Jesus tree. Amen. And now we're His children. And I'm a child of the King. A child of the King. <clears throat> now this old eunuch, let's keep reading verse 34. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. <clears throat> what does this mean? Is the question the world is asking today. What does Jesus mean? What did all that have to do? What's that, What's going on here? So Isaiah, or this, I'm sorry, the Ethiopian, he asked the same question that most people are asking in the world today. He said, what is this? Was Isaiah talking about himself? Was he talking about somebody he knew? Who was he talking about there? And so old Philip, then he took that question and he ran a straight beeline to the cross. Now, if there's any preachers in here, let me tell you how to preach the Old Testament. You want to know? You want to tell you how to preach the Old Testament? Take any story you got and take a beeline for the cross. Amen? Amen. Because the whole Old Testament is, is pointing to the cross. It's saying, that's what it's that's what's come up. So uh, he, he knew the door was open and he began to tell that wonderful story of Jesus. Jesus is the answer. I don't know what your question is. But Jesus is the answer. I don't know what you're looking for, but Jesus is what you need to find. He is the good news. <clears throat> then he said, okay, Philip, I believe. I believe in this Jesus. 
and I don't know how much more of the conversation happened there. Uh, they, they traveled down the road together. I'm sure that Philip began to tell him about Jesus and connect some of the Old Testament dots and, and cross the I's and dot the T's. You know what I'm saying? I got that backwards, but you know what I mean. And, and so they, they went on down the road there and he discipled him a little bit. And then we get to verse 36. As they travel along the road, they, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my, of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. You know what you're reading? You know what you're, you know what you're talking about? You want life You know what the Bible's trying to tell you? That's the same question. He's trying, the Bible's trying to tell you that Jesus is the, the your answer. Jesus is God's Son. And uh, if you believe in, the, in Jesus, or you believe in the Son of God, the Son of Man, yeah, that's what it's trying to ask you. Do you believe that He's offered salvation and redemption to whosoever will? You see, that's what I believe. That God didn't have any favorite groups. He didn't, have, he didn't like this group over here a little bit. He better than He liked this group over here. He liked us all even. And He said, whosoever will may come. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Yeah, boy. Mm -mm. I've always been deep intrigued with that. It's just <clears throat> and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Azotus is 53 miles away. <laughs> and the Spirit took him away. See, I, there's a lot of ways to understand this. First of all, you can understand it by the, this Ethiopian was so excited about what happened. He was so filled with the Spirit, so thrilled that his sins were forgiven, so thrilled that he followed his Lord in baptism and been saved, and he's on his way to heaven. He got so happy and rejoicing, he never paid any attention to what happened to Philip. I believe that's one thing that's going to happen. Or the Spirit of God could just translate him, transport him to, to Azotus, 53 miles away. I don't, either way is fine with me, however they want to do it. <clears throat> so this now this snatching away of people is not at all common in the New Testament. That didn't happen very many times. Uh, in the Old Testament, wasn't it? One of the old prophets was was translated into heaven, snatched away. And now we have this young man here, Philip the deacon, and he was snatched away. Uh, this is rare. So, but the Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing, and Philip went on with his mission. And, the, and that's where how the two parted ways. Let me say to you, everybody needs to hear the story of Jesus. Amen. And everybody in this room tonight is Philip. You are the deacon. You are the, the missionary. You are the one that's supposed to tell this story. And we're going to be going up and down our roads. We're going to be coming in contact with people. We're going to meet people. And their, their life story is going to be asking, who is this Jesus? I don't understand what I'm reading about in my Bible. What's everybody talking about when they talk about Jesus? And you need to tell them who He is. Take their questions and make a beeline to the cross. Listen to what they say and tell them how to be saved and redeemed and born again. Everybody needs to hear the story of Jesus. Everybody wants to hear the story of Jesus. Now, anybody can lead somebody else to Jesus. Anybody can. You can. I can. Uh, you don't have to be seminary trained. You don't have to go to Sunday school. You don't have to know much of nothing. Just tell, tell them what your life was like before you met Jesus and what it's like after you met Him. That, that's all you need to know. Tell them about Jesus. I guess what I'm going to ask you is what's keeping you from being a modern day Philip? What's keeping you? Nothing. Or maybe some of you here today, uh, have, uh, you need to believe in Jesus. You need to accept Him as your Savior and be, and be baptized. Be baptized in the Spirit and then baptized in water. That's, that's what we need to do. That's what we are. This is the story. Law of the Lord denied.